thing, which is probably also true. Yeah. Wow. You know what? We've had guests that uh, that showed up at a lot more less predictable times than you did. So that was perfect. <laughs> yeah. And in a lot less appropriate attire. I mean, this is this is a, as good as it gets. I prepared. Did you wear that during your meeting before this? That shirt? <laughs> no. Oh, I had point. like business on the top on my last meeting, so it was like a flannel. And then I'm like, all right, now it's time to party. And yeah. I took it off. That's how I am. It's it's one of those things about podcasting, like you know, no one knows what's going on underneath the desk type of a thing. And unless you're Savon, he likes to sometimes show under the desk his toes and stuff, weird stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> but for the most part, you know, everyone switched to uh virtual meetings and this kind of became a much more common thing several years ago. And that was, I think, kind of, although I say that was, it was kind of the joke then, do you could, PC, you probably remember, do you remember the uh, ESPN commercial? It's John something or other when he was like in his room with all the death metal stuff. And then, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it's uh, been a joke for a long time. Yeah. The time. professor, that was his name. Um, yeah. Yeah. Claiborne, is it? I don't know. Mm, I forgot his name. But anyways. Anyway. Yeah. We have, uh, well, I mean, she's not putting her full. Alexis, will you, can you say your last name for me? I think that I've been saying it right. Brian, you've said it right. I think you're the first person to ever say it right. I said uh, it right last night. De trois. De trois. Yes. Well, I did take French for 12 years in school. And even though I can no longer speak French, there's maybe <laughs> a, still a little bit of a carryover. And obviously, uh, I'm assuming a French Canadian name. So I'm not French Canadian, which nope. probably not. Uh, my background's like Creole, so it's Black French. Um, and Carolyn's. French Canadian. So she, her first language is French. Um, so she'll always say, Oh, like my last name spelled odd or wrong according to like the French, uh, mm. ways of spelling. Um, and I have been taking Duolingo for three years, I think, um, trying to impress her and her family, but I can tell you <laughs> it has not worked. Well, yes. In, in French, it would be O I, you know, T O I L E. Exactly. Here's yep. his I O. But that makes sense with the Creole. I have a little familiarity with Creole, having lived in the Dominican Republic, pretty close to the Haitian border for a couple of years. And I knew a bunch of, we, you know, we taught the kids there and we had some Haitian students spoke Creole. Um, so that's my kind of exposure to it. But yeah, I mean, I had always said it that way and I thought that, but then of course the spelling was a little off, but you never know. So thank you for yeah. affirming what I thought was the case. Anyway, Alexis Dutois, um, you, you you used to be a pretty high level competitor in CrossFit. Um, I don't know if you kind of gave up that pursuit at some point or if you just uh, uh, surgery, of... Brian. I had a uh, spinal fusion two Ooh. years ago. Um, I was actually injured when I went to uh, Filthy 150, um, which I think was our first like go about. Um, I injured my neck in some crazy handstand push up accident, um, and it just cause like a bunch of nerve issues later on. Um, so I ended up getting a spinal fusion. I came back, um, wasn't like, I would say four or five months out and did the open that year. Um, and then I was working my way back up and um, actually tore my elbow on a clean. So not even a snatch, like everyone does. They said they've wow. never seen that before, but um, tur was turning over on just a lighter clean and it popped and uh, had to get the good old elbow surgery that everyone's had, seems like. So it's been a, it's been a tough go on the injury front for the last couple of years, but I, I'm assuming you're still staying active, finding ways to get the fitness in? Still work out, still participating. I get like the good old participation award and then coaching Carolyn to try to get back to the game. So hopefully we'll see there. Yeah, and when did you and uh, Carolyn first meet? Uh, COVID. I think it was 2020, somewhere around there. And then we got married last year. And, uh, you know, Alexis to talk, um, I don't, I don't know if you go on very many podcasts or if you've been on many podcasts before related to CrossFit. Clydesdale. I'm usually like his behind the scenes informant. So I send Scott <laughs> all what's going on in the news, uh, with a DM or a screenshot of something. And then he has like a document that I'll add to, but normally it's just Carolyn goes on and then uh, I send her all the stuff that she should bring up. Well, we uh, know that you and Carolyn are both very 
you know, plugged into what's going on in the sport of CrossFit, the world of CrossFit. Um, and when we were kind of planning this series, <clears throat> you know, we wanted to invite people on that would have some perspective on the given uh, category or group of people, athletes that we were talking about, but maybe aren't coaching necessarily. I mean, obviously you are coaching Carolyn, but like not a, a coach of a major program or training camp or something like that. So someone that has a fair amount of knowledge about the relevant group of people, um, whether it's, you know, and you have this kind of, you you know, we're a competitive athlete uh, towards the top of the women's field and in, I guess, the East region of North America is what we would call it now. And also are still integrally interested in it from a competitive standpoint. But also, I think it's just something that you like to consume CrossFit content. It seems that way, at least from the way you interact with us. I do. I try to stay in the know, too, just because Carolyn's so high level still. I think it's important for us to know what's going on, what people are doing, and um, how we need to elevate or uh, adjust her training um, according to what's going on out there. Uh, but yeah, also, I think just with technology, sometimes I'm just nosy as hell. Um, <laughs> so I just want to know what people are doing, uh, which could be a good thing and a bad thing. I guess so. And you're certainly not the only one. There are a lot of people that want to want to know what's going on. But um, <clears throat> if you guys missed it last week, we did this something very similar with the men in Europe. We know that we could choose the women in Europe or we could choose the men in North America, East or whatever. There's a lot of competitive regions where there is a great amount of depth. We want to try to spread the love a little bit. So last week we had uh, Nikolai Rono on. If you're curious about what the landscape looks like in the Europeans men's field um, this season, you can go and check out the article and the podcast accompanying it. And if you did see that last week, this is going to have a very similar feel only for the women in North America East. Um, you know, I think that on maybe get with the programming, they've done some studies about how many European women are represented in the top 100 after the open or something like that. Um, but we're going to focus on the North American East women's field, which is uh, extremely competitive region. Um, and you're going to see pretty quick off the bat that even though the champion from North America East women's field is leaving last year, the field is actually stronger than it was even without her there. And so right off the bat, you know, Alexis, we'll kind of uh, open this up to you here. We see these are the 11 qualifiers from last year. Emma Carey obviously did take the win down in Orlando. We know she's not competing this year. Um, and then the, the rest of the 10 women, as far as we know, have the intention of competing again. Um, Caroline Stanley I'm, I, is actually, she's on a roster for a team at uh, Crash Crescendo, which is a team competition. I don't know. Uh, if she's going to just kind of doing that for fun, some of the some of the athletes on those teams seem to be just kind of doing that as a, a because they know it's a great competition that JR runs out there. But my understanding is all 10 of these women are here. Um, I would guess that between 10 and 12 spots will be allocated to the North America East women's field just based on what we know about this, you know, one plus year old system that we have. Um, and when you look at this group, Alexis, kind of knowing these women well, uh, we did this with Nico last week. You know, knowing let's just pretend there's 11 spots again. And don't worry about anyone that's not on this right now. When you look at these women, do you start counting some names as being like, you know, barring injury or illness? I would say we probably have four or five, six, whatever spots that are going to be pretty difficult to unseat. Yeah, I would say, yeah, at least half of these, um, barring any injuries or anything going on, are kind of solidified spots. And I think, you know, you see these and you're like, these are the ones that went to the games last year. But there's also the additional that have been to the games, you know, two years ago or even in the past that are coming back um, that even add to that roster of, hey, these may be confirmed and solidified spots. So, you know, you take out Aunt Emma Carey, but you could easily replace her with uh, Tia, who's coming back or uh, one of the other ones that are coming back. Um, so I would say, you know, out of these, we know uh, Alexis Raptus had some health concerns in the past, but she's overall looking pretty good. And uh, I would say that's a solidified spot. Um, we see uh, Paige, Paige and Brooke, pen, Brooke pending any injuries. And we've talked to that. Um, she didn't qualify for the games last year, but she's obviously a perennial games athlete. Um, you know, you see Caroline Stanley, who she may not have performed as she expected at the games, 
but her consistency and just uh, maybe moving to like the camp uh, environment where she's at now can lead to some break additional breakout performance. And then obviously Danielle Brandon at that top of the list, who's always relatively consistent and performs amazing at both quarterfinals and semifinals that we know of. So um, it's going to be hard for people to break through that haven't been to the games, I would say in this, um, this region or the East. Yeah. And that's a, you know, First of all, that's a great point that we still have to go through the quarterfinals. And that's part of the reason that we're doing this now, actually, is because there's only 40 spots available. Last year, there were 60. And even though if you just plucked these women and put them into a semifinal field against 40, 60 women, you'd expect them to do quite well. Uh, a, a lot less of a guarantee that, you know, athletes who may take that version, that stage of the season for granted can get through, especially if there's some kind of a penalty uh, you know, that, that comes down with a scoring review or you don't execute perfectly relative to the description of a workout and you get a penalty for that reason. Suddenly, something that seemed fairly straightforward may not be. As far as last year's semifinal went, there was definitely a line drawn after page powers of this list where the six women above that were <clears throat> 148 points clear of Sydney Wells in seventh place. Um, obviously, without Emma there, there's five remaining. And of those five, I would say Brandon Lawson, Raptus, and Powers are looking just as good as you would expect, you know, a year on from having a successful season. And Amanda Barnhart, who uh, did kind of come out and tell everyone that she had a labrum tear last year at the games, is maybe the one question mark of that top group. Uh, and I would say that that's probably like a good starting point, is that we see, we can say like those four names, Brandon Lawson, Raptus Powers, seem like a pretty good lock of the last year's women. We would obviously say that about Amanda Barnhart if we knew that she was 100% healthy. But even if you look at her open finish there, 80th place is not going to get it done in the quarterfinals. And obviously, similarly to a Brooke Wells or a Tia Claire Toomey, who we'll talk about in a second, maybe there's some decision-making happening in the open just to buy yourself that extra four or five weeks before the quarterfinals. Um, <clears throat> but the rest of the women on this list are already off to a good start this season and are more or less athletes that you would expect to still do well in the quarterfinal stage. So before we, before we move on, if, if you have any other thoughts about women's, just, uh, the, the women returning from last year's games in the NA East field. No, I just think, you know, like you mentioned in that top group, Barnhart's like the only question mark when it comes to the ones that kind of took over um, semifinals last year. Um, and then the other spots may be variable or you'll see somebody who uh, was pretty close to kind of break into that. But like you mentioned, the 40 spots in quarter or to get from quarterfinals to semifinals, it's going to be for at least like the 15 to 40 position dictated by what the workouts are are and how many workout out, workouts there are going to be um, so I think it matters more than it has in the past just because of the amount of people that are going through the quarterfinals of whether you see a single modality for example uh, such as a lift um, in there that can use some of those results um, or if it's just you know what he said four workouts and it's four scores that may impact who we see even make it to the top 40 and you might see people who are games athletes from the past or even high performing semifinals athletes not even get to the semifinals this year yeah and i would say that's probably the overarching theme of the of the, this conversation regardless of what we, region it is, it is is that there are athletes that you would just expect to make it to semifinals that won't make it i mean there's always athletes that break through and there has to be room for that. And we're about to see what this, what the real depth of this region looks like because outside of these 10, we picked another, well, 11 actually, another 11. <laughs> I, I, I just like had an oversight when I was first doing this article and forgot Tia, which is a ridiculous thing to forget. But um, we put her back in here now. So thank you to those that uh, reminded us of that. And when you, and looking at this group of athletes, you know, you've already referenced the fact that there are, games athletes, and in some cases, perennial games athletes in this field that didn't make it last year. Most notably is obviously Tia. She can probably just be a, a, equated as a direct swap for an Emma Carey. <clears throat> and then beyond that, you have Haley Adams returning to the field to play. Brooke Wells, who's, you know, she was close last year. 
maybe uh, uncertain with the uh, injury status. Bailey Rail, who's made the games, I think, three times in a row. And then you have Freya and Carolyn, who've also been to the CrossFit Games as individuals. Um, and I mean, if you don't, even if you just stop right there, we've already gone past the number of spots that, that are going to be allocated to the North America East field. And, um, and we're kind of just getting started. I think, like you mentioned, a couple of things. One, um, Carolyn and I talked about how it might be good for quite a bit of these athletes are in training camps. So they're going to be doing quarterfinals with each other um, and have the visibility to see what people's scores or are or what they get in a specific workout to determine if they need to redo something or where they could pick up speed or just learning from those. Um, and then you have athletes who may potentially work out by themselves who don't have that visibility. So Carolyn trains by herself, for example, and doesn't um, do any of the qualifiers with anyone else. So she doesn't really have the visibility to see what's going on there or learn from it. But I think that will help benefit quite a bit of these athletes. You saw Freya uh, switch to tra training think tank, and I think that's just elevated her from an athlete piece. Uh, you could see from her open performance there. She has Ashley Wozni there. Um, and then you have quite a bit of these other athletes who are at different locations in training camps. Um, I'll be interested to see what Haley is able to do as she comes back um, and just where um, her head is because I think she's more at peace um, and finding herself and like figuring out what makes her happy. So it'll be good to see how she progresses through quarterfinals and even to the semifinals level to see if she, you know, could get back to the games there. Um, and then you talked more about like the younger upper and comer. So Annika's younger, Jordan's younger, um, and they have so much uh, growth and opportunity there. Like they haven't hit their ceiling. Um, I find women peak, you know, later uh, and can start going until they're, you know, in their early 30s. So they have definitely like a lot of potential and a lot of room to still hit their peak performance. And um, they, I believe they were both tied maybe in the semifinals or close. They were tied in points. Uh, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, but they were tied in points. And then Annika got the, had the higher um, win. So she was placed higher, but um, that will be a, a good battle to see there um, of what can happen both in quarterfinals and then semifinals. I want to, I want to bring this up because, uh, you know, um, Caroline did bring this up <laughs> and uh, kind of wanted to show, because this is, these are the women we're talking about right now, but uh, only 20 points separating a lot of these, you know, from game spots. And we're talking, I mean, you can go even go to Sydney Wells at seventh at 409 points. And we're talking, you know, around 20 points going all the way down to her sister, Brooke, and even Carolyn. So, and then Ashley Wozniak's a good, uh, was that 22 points behind that? But from 15th to almost, I guess ninth or I'm sorry to seventh very close race, especially that final day. And these are a lot of the same women we're talking about right now. Yeah. And a pretty good, pretty good blend in terms of both <clears throat> age and experience in, in the group of women that we're talking about. I mean, both Annika and, and Jordan chefs are, I think 21 this year. Um, we have uh, Lydia fish kind of entering the equation. She's 20 years old. She had a decent off season. And then you have a few, I want to say like uh, maybe veteran athletes that have been around, you know, fees getting closer to 30. Um, but she also seems like Alexis is saying to kind of be hitting her stride in terms of the the, bet, the fittest she's ever been as she gets close to 30, which is not necessarily unprecedented. You know, Carolyn, I think is th she's getting close to being master's age. She's I think 34 this year. It's hard to keep track as the, the game season always puts the age that they'll be at the game. So she's either 33 or 34. Of course, Master Alexis, next year. Master next year. Um, <clears throat> but we'll see later on in this list that it's, even if you are a master's athlete, especially in North America East, that does not preclude you from being pretty impressively fit. Uh, we have a little group of women uh, that we dedicated just to the master's athletes that did incredibly well this year in the Open from North America East. But, <clears throat> you know, this concept that you're talking about of some athletes, I mean, you might be able to test the workouts for Carolyn and then she could have some kind of an idea in that regard. But other athletes will be in those environments where they have the opportunity to watch 
athletes who they know are, are going to be setting competitive scores and then can gauge based on that. And with the additional days that they've allotted, you know, they've, as advertised, it's basically a six day window with four workouts to do. Maybe there'll be a, a two parter or something like that, but clearly there's a potential for redoing these workouts if needed. And that's always one of those things that's debated in CrossFit because uh, in live competition, which is ultimately what we're testing for is to get to the semifinals where you've got one shot. And then if you get to the games, you've got one shot. And yet here we have a qualifying stage, much like it used to be with the open where you can redo workouts potentially as a right to get the chance to compete on that competitive floor. Um, <clears throat> if you were giving advice to young athletes and they did have an opportunity to either do it kind of in the, the environment that they're most comfortable with or travel somewhere and do it in around a, a training camp potentially that they had, they don't, maybe they don't train in that often. Would you have any suggestion either way? I think it depends on the person. Like I've always been the type that I just like doing it from my gym um, and not getting yelled at or having someone <laughs> next to me doing it at the same time. Um, and that's kind of where my headspace was. Uh, but there's people who enjoy like the being fired up by the crowd or having a benchmark to go against. So it really depends on them. And if they don't feel comfortable going to another location, maybe there's somebody at their gym that can be like their bunny that they could try to catch or just does certain pieces of the workout with them next to them to pace them during that. So I've had somebody who would row at the same time as me. So I knew where my row needed to be or would come in and do the 10 bar facing burpees that come up. And then that's my pace just to stay with them. Um, and that's been relatively helpful. Uh, but it has to be what works for them. Like you don't want to put yourself in a situation that makes it stressful. And then you're in your head through the weekend especially when it matters and it's hypercritical this year, just based on the amount of spots that are given to even get to semifinals. Yeah. And then kind of the last com component here of this group of women is, you know, we see the three women that competed out West last year, Bailey rail, who we mentioned, uh, Freya Musburger, who had made the games previously. Um, and then Brittany Weiss, who's, you know, been historically a team athlete, obviously winning the CrossFit games with CrossFit Invictus last year. Uh, she's given uh, it a run in the individual field. We have seen throughout the history of the sport that men and women can have success in the team realm and then parlay that into individual success. Bailey, you know, rail or Bailey rail, Christopher, uh, having that, you know, some team experience in the past and then becoming a pretty successful, uh, athlete on the individual side as well. Um, <clears throat> and it's, you know, it'll be, in, it, it'll be curious. It will be curious to see because obviously all three of, well, actually, Brittany is an interesting case, given the the way that they do the scoring system, the, the worldwide rankings, because I don't know, actually, I'd have to check if she did the quarter individual quarterfinals any she of the didn't, past two years. She didn't do it last year. She did the previous year, though. <clears throat> so she'd have, basically, she'll have negligible points. So she has no chance of being in the top 100 and impacting that to haunt distribution method. And yet she is a relevant, you know, uh, name. You can look at some of her, especially online performances, that she's fairly competitive and is going to be in this mix. <clears throat> but man, I mean, we're only 20, this is, I guess, 21 names so far. We're expecting that just less than half of them won't, you know, won't be able to make it no matter if they have a perfect run through quarters and semis, just because there's not enough spots. Um, so, and we're going to keep, continue to look at, at other women in this field that are, um, you know, they basically to get onto the, into this conversation, you need to have had a uh, competitive success, whether it's in the open, uh, quarterfinal stage last year, semifinals last year, off-season competitions that we've seen you in or some combination of those things. Um, so this should give you a good idea of what potentially the top half of the 40 women that make it to the NA East could be. Patrick or Alexis, any uh, thoughts on any of these athletes before we kind of move further down the list? Um, before we move on, one thing, and I, I kind of mentioned it, I, and I'm not sure if you even knew this, Brian, but uh, you know how I like certain stats. But, you know, you look at someone, Danielle Brandon, and Danielle Brandon has a um, – she's the only woman, North American woman, that's podium in three different semifinals, um, joining the likes of Laura Horvath, uh, Michelle Baznet, who's a uh, podium in Africa, and I forgot who the third – oh, um, uh, Julio Cato. So – um, Danielle, you know, um, I mean, it's a tough field because this field is the only field male or female that will have four semifinal champions. And you're talking Tia's won a semifinal. She's won multiple semifinals 
in North America and Oceania. Haley Adams is actually the last syndicate cha- uh, syndicate crown champion. Um, and then you have DB who won uh, semifinal two years ago. And then, of course, Emma Lawson, who's, who won the Atlas Games and uh, won this um, won the semifinal last year. So, I mean, just those four names, you have champions, you have champion pedigrees just in this potential semifinal. And I'm, and of course, I'm looking, at, I'm looking ahead to semifinals, but um, sure. At, and your your uh, stat is uh, you can see it on the Be Friendly Fitness Instagram, and it's actually was Victoria Campos, not yeah, Victoria uh, Campos. Julie yeah. Canto, and Ellie yeah. Turner. And the reason Ellie. that Patrick's mentioning that they've made a podium at three semifinals is because there's only been three years of semifinals, mm-hmm. so it's whittling it down to those select group of women, which is four. And Michelle Baznet's not competing this year. Ellie Turner's not competing this year. So only Daniel, or five, excuse me, Brandon, Horvath, and Campos are the only ones that have a chance to continue to extend that streak if they podium at their respective semifinals this season. And, cool. Yeah. And I will if you say can... Carolyn, Carolyn won the virtual one too the year, so she's won a semifinal. Oh, there we go. You're right. Correct. I forgot about that. Yep. So Come on, Patrick. Five. That's five. <laughs> So they're trying to slide but, that past Alexis. I know, but that yeah. but that shows you that shows you how stacked this field is. So if you can podium with this these these women, these incredible women at that particular semifinal, that's saying a lot because it's you know you're 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 in a company of champions there, and obviously the champion. And then um, another thing I wanted to talk about is like, and I think we could talk about it later, but the impact of injuries. You know, we mentioned um, we mentioned. Uh, Amanda Barnhart and of course Brooke Wells is dealing with a similar uh, injury but uh, something that occurred more recently right after Wadapalooza's a torn labrum as well and then we can't discount Tia's injury you know it wasn't the greatest performance we can see right here what she did in the open 2000 you know 610 even the workouts that she did do um, you know she kind of kind of cashed in on the last workout but even the first workout where she was doing the burpees with a fist so it was obviously affecting her. So how does that affect her? Maybe in quarterfinals, gripping a barbell. Again, we're only taking four. By no means, I'm not saying I'm saying T is not going to make the semifinals out of quarters. However, that might be something that's still, you know, maybe she hasn't had enough time to recover from an injury. She goes to quarterfinals where there's probably going to be a lot of barbell where she's going to have to grip, and you know, it might it might carry over to semifinals as well. As she prepares because it's a, the season is really quick up until after semifinals and you have a couple months off till the games and you know that's a lot of stuff that's a lot of training a lot of stuff that she's doing so she may not look at it as she's trying to win a semifinal more in terms of just making the semifinals and i think that's a big point to make if you're looking at the team quarterfinals and depending on how crossfit does it if they're going to make similar workouts to the team quarterfinals for individuals, or if they do what they've done the last couple of years where they're relatively different and you could could have essentially done both of them and then mm-hmm. been fine because the movements vary a bit, uh, could be dependent on how Tia and even Brooke does because in this quarterfinals for the team, you have moderate front squats, you have shoulder to overhead, you have the ring muscle ups and just seeing those types of movement, it could worry you to say, how is Tia going to be holding a front rack? Because that puts so much load and strain on your wrist. Um, And if that was the pain or the limiter for her in the open when the weight was relatively lighter, it could be a pain and a limiter there. Not saying that Tia can't like, you know, Mm -hmm. roll up and put, you know, multiple wrist wraps on and uh, beast through it. I wouldn't put it past her um, or to just, set the pain aside but if she didn't want it to continue to progress into something worse it may you know impact her performance there um and then same with brooke wells when i tore my labrum in my shoulder um muscle ups ring and bar were pretty significant and caused quite a bit of pain there just from the time under tension and the pulling piece and the rotation in your shoulder so it'll be interesting to see how that plays for her if there are ring muscle ups in the individual quarterfinals yeah and those are also movements that brooke isn't necessarily strong with to begin with up that upper body pulling you know you look at like if there's legless rope climbs in the semifinals or quarterfinals which there have been in the past but you know like you said muscle ups ring muscle ups those are you know you add that injury factor to someone like brooke and only 40 spots. I mean, me and Brian have discussed this. There's, there's, I mean, there's a possibility that, you know, 
you know some of these some of these names that are used to seeing in semifinals might be struggling to get to semifinals. So it'll be interesting to see. And of course, I wouldn't put like I said, I wouldn't put anything past past Tia, Brooke, or Amanda. Obviously, they're great athletes. Uh, they're you know they're podium contenders in a year. Um, but um, you know, like I said, there's there's just the two two lists the the two graphs we've looked at. There's some some impressive names there, veteran and newcomers that are. You know, they're just looking for that opportunity. And I think if, you know, just like Carol, uh, like Carolyn Stanley or or Freya a couple of years ago, you know, they, they had that opportunity because of some injuries. And and, you know, they they've used that to build their confidence. And now they're looking to return to the game. So we'll see. And Brian, before you move on, the only other thing I would say is the penalties that are given in quarterfinals will be even more important and imperative. Um, I think they'll request from the top 60, I believe is what mm -hmm. it said somewhere. Um, so, you know, you get one, even a minor penalty and your points out of qualifying for the, the semifinal. So it's important to have like, you know, virtuosity in your movement, I would say. Um, just make sure that you're holding yourself to those standards. Your judge is holding you to those standards because it's not guaranteed. And if they're reviewing those videos from the top 60 and you get one penalty on a workout, you're out. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how strict CrossFit is when it comes to that um, and their judging during quarterfinals. Yeah, I mean, I'm still very curious to see the process of reviewing the quarterfinal workouts is, as I understand it, it's, uh, as you said, Alexis, that they would ask for 60, the top 60 in any competitive region um, to have the videos. And then I believe they said that they will review a minimum of one. Um, right. So, you know, that, that leaves the door open for all kinds of different scenarios. Obviously, they could review more than that. Uh, I don't know how they would go about determining, you know, if they wanted to review more of mine compared to Patrick's or whatever, um, it might be a case where if you have some penalties, then they might want to look up, uh, elsewhere also. Um, but it might be the case where the one they asked for is actually just your perfect workout and you had, and you were maybe nervous about some of the others and they didn't get asked for. So it seems like with the time frame that they have, the total volume of executing this part of the season, that it's, uh, it's impossible to really check all the boxes to make sure that each of the 40 athletes in each of the seven competitive regions and each of the divisions, male, female, are going to, um, you know, be meeting all those standards. But as an athlete, you never know. You don't know what they're going to ask for. You don't know what they're going to look for. And everything that Alexa said is what I would be uh, striving for. Set up yourself for success by having coaches or people that you trust, you know, double check those things. You should be reading everything yourself. Um, <clears throat> and take the time, you know, if CrossFit's asking you to do any kind of measurements, even for the team quarterfinals, it's got to be five feet from here to here for safety reasons, like err on the side of caution, do five feet and three inches, like what, you know, those three inches aren't going to matter. Just like make sure that you're not going to get a silly penalty that's going to end your season short. Yeah. And, and that was a great point, bringing up penalties. Um, just looking at what the, they CrossFit rolled out for the team quarterfinals. They have not done judges any favors with some of those movements. I mean, they picked some very complicated movements um, that can ride the line where, you know, you have one judge judging, you know, uh, multiple athletes at the same time. So and then they also didn't do any favors by not coming up with a floor plan or anything like that. You know, and I understand why they did both of those things. But at the same time, they're not doing any, they're not doing judges or themselves any favors. And I don't see that changing for individual quarterfinals if they haven't done it for team. So just my two cents on that. All right. Let's continue down through the article here. We've got 20 more athletes in this next group. Um, <clears throat> and maybe we just can kind of pause there. There's just alphabetical, uh, athletes in this list have, um, you know, I've kind of selected them basically based on, uh, again, credentials from the past or maybe projecting towards what could be possible this year. You know, there's some cases where like, uh, on this list that we can see Erica Folo was a games athlete on a team last year. Alexis, you may know her cause it's a Canadian team, PSC invasion, Addison Desrosier, competed on a team two years ago. She's actually is going individual this year, 17th in the open. Um, I, I think that's in the North America East, she was 17th in the open. So obviously it's relevant against this field. Uh, so we have some athletes like this, maybe coming from a team division like Brittany Weiss and throwing their name in the individual ring. You have an athlete like Brianna Wallen coming back from pregnancy, 
She's already had some successful uh, performances in the off season once to get good in the open. And then you have some athletes that were, you know, pretty good at semifinals last year. Still, you know, Lexi Neely was 17th. Al- Amanda Fisher was 18th. Calista Lang 21st. Uh, Caitlin Sanders 20th. Um, so you can see kind of different ways that athletes end up on this list. Alexis, I'll kind of open it to you first. If there's anyone on here that you maybe know, know something about, or are excited to see this year. Um, yeah. So you brought up Erica Folo. Uh, she's a Canadian. So Carolyn knows her and is familiar with that. Um, Carolyn has her as one of the dark horses on her list um, just because she's very strong, um, but also has great gymnastics and has the team experience. So it'll be interesting to see what she does. She did great in the open. Um, and, you know, I expect her to do relatively well again in the quarterfinals and then qualify for semis. Um, so it will be cool to see what she's able to do. Um, the other name, I don't think you scrolled down to this person yet. Um, nope. Wait, maybe is she on there? Yep. Lindsay Lane. So that's the one who won crash, if I'm not mistaken. Um, she's coached by JR. JR is like the sensei um, when it comes to coaching. So um, I'm interested to see what she's able to do in a strong field, um, considering how well she did at crash um, in that programming that was there. Um, she's also listed as our other dark horse uh, with potential, but um, you see quite a bit of athletes on here who are also just very strong. So Rose Scott, Dana Peran, um, Amanda Fisher. So I'm just curious if uh, quarterfinals doesn't have a single modality mm-hmm. strength, um, what their capabilities are as far as hanging on the moderate barbells and it's more barbell cardio um, and cycling compared maybe with a body weight or a gymnastics movement. So i um, curious to see that dynamic and balance, but um, if there is a strength, you know, I expect them to be at the top of that list there too. Um, and then the last one I'll talk to, um, which I just saw compete and then she was at Wadapalooza was Elizabeth uh, Wizard. I think that's how you say her last yeah. name. Um, yeah. She was also at NorCal Classic. So I was able to see her compete in person and she's got really uh, good um, cardiovascular uh, conditioning and endurance. So um, again, I'll be curious to see what she does um, and if she's able to move up and break into the semifinals um, this year. I think last year she had one workout that was a hole for her. Maybe it was the crossover one, which might have been different for every or a uh, similar story for everyone who wasn't familiar with crossover single unders. Um, so I'll be curious to see what she does there. Uh, she's relatively like middle of the pack when it comes to strength uh, snatch, like 175, 180 um, and around there. So um, I don't think that's like her overall strong suit, but her endurance over time is going to be interesting to see. And if it's just moderate weights again in quarterfinals, she should do well there uh, to break in. Yeah, you are correct, by the way. It was the, the <laughs> she was 266 on a East on the crossover workout, which was over 100 spots worse than her worst performance. And she had two 25th place finishes in, against that field in, uh, in last year in quarterfinals. And I, I would agree. She seems to be trending in the right direction, having gotten some good offseason competition and results. And if she's, um, you know, if, she, if there isn't that, that, if there is that kind of moderate weight cycling of barbell, like I think that's an area where that aerobic threshold can can show through, as opposed to someone like a, you know a Fisher, or a Rose Scott, something like that. They would love to see a heavy lift, um, maybe different heavy heavy lifts that different uh, athletes would prefer to see. But especially the way that strength is tested during the quarterfinals can certainly dictate some of the potential that athletes on this section of the list would have. PC I'll give you the same kind of opportunity. I, I'm I think there are a few other athletes on the list that you know some stuff about that Alexis did not. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm when I think of the quarterfinals, you know, I think of it as, as an extension, especially this year of the open and what we saw kind of in the uh, team team programming is like nothing really high skilled outside of like some ring muscle ups um, and uh, some handstand push ups. And I, I'm I'm going to say that's probably going to be the same for the um, for the individual, probably not a lot of high skill, high weight. It's just more continuation of like uh, more capacity work, more cr- 
CrossFit. And when I think of that, I think of athletes like Brianna Wallen. I think of Elizabeth. <clears throat> I think of uh, Lindsay Porter. You know, these are all athletes who are really just overall just good CrossFit athletes. Um, and I think they might do might surprise to do very well. And these are also athletes who are still relatively young um, and they've they've been at regionals, they've been at semifinals. So they know how it kind of flows and they're experts at that. Um, and then I look at an athlete like uh, Elena Buds. Uh, you know, she had an amazing open, obviously finishing fifth overall. Uh, but she was on the she's only 25 years old. She was injured pretty much all last season. Uh, she was kind of in that upward trajectory. I mean, she ha was qualified for two different semifinals, did really well, and then uh, ran into some injuries last year. But, um, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, she kind of maybe bumps into that next tier of athletes that we had above, um, as, as long, you know, as well as someone like Calista Lang, who, you know, just from that post we put up today, she seems to be a very popular athlete, especially amongst her community. Uh, she is coached by, I believe, uh, Mike Needleman as well. And then, um, and then a, another group of athletes. I'm going to kind of talk about both of them, uh, Jessica Androzik and Nina uh, was a uh, Ragovich. Ragovich, uh, two um, disciples of Dom, uh, Coach Dom down at Mayhem. Uh, he, they, both of them, followed him up to Mayhem, and they are training. They they've been in Cookville, just training away. And um, Nina had a really good. Um, she won the what what comp monster comp last year uh looked really good and, and a pretty impressive field and then um i think jessica is a hundred percent after a very very devastating elbow injury and um if there's something handstand push-up involved in the quarterfinals i look at jessica Androzic probably winning that event if it's uh purely uh handstand push-ups or max handstand push-ups or anything like that but overall that's that's about all i have from this group but i do like Lindsay lane as well and Elia Hiller, just a really good, solid group of names in this group. So yeah, a lot, lot of, lot of talent here, a lot of potential, and this is kind of probably the group that I'm looking at. Like someone from this group or a couple women from this group are going to do something impressive this season, whether it's in the quarterfinals, the semifinals, or both. It's not. I mean, it's it's not out of the realm of possibility of a name from this list being right there on the last day of semifinals, even with the chance to punch one of those last couple of tickets to the games. Obviously, with the 20 or so names that we saw prior to this, we know that's going to be a big ask. But this is sports and things, you know, we've talked about a bunch of different uh, scenarios with injuries, with review process, with penalties. And then on the other side, <clears throat> some of these athletes are just hitting their stride and they're coming in. You know, I even look at an athlete like Caitlin Sanders. You know, I, she doesn't do a ton of off-season competing necessarily, but look at the consistency there. 20th last year at semifinals, 31st last year in quarterfinals, 29th against the North America East field in the Open this year. Like, the ability to be consistent like that basically just means that you're putting yourself in the position to have the opportunity over and over and over again. Um, so, And she's 30 years old, kind of right in that range of, uh, of maybe entering into a potentially maybe her best season. So um, good names to kind of just be aware of. And also the, the cool thing that Patrick kind of referenced is these, like every athlete on this point uh, up to, up to this point on the list, <clears throat> they're pursuing uh, like being great at this. And when you do that, that means that there's a group of people that are invested in your success. And so it's fun. You know, if you're looking on the uh, uh, Instagram post that Patrick Put together there keep in mind those are not our, any predictions or rankings that's a sample of athletes from the north america east women's field that he's chosen to kind of represent different groups and demographics some of them obviously are established some of them are on the fringe some of them are up and coming some of them maybe a little bit less well known um and then we it's fun for us to see those communities rally behind their people their athletes um and and support them and even you know each one of these names comes with a group of people like that that's in their corner that this thing. Um, so that's kind of giving you a picture of what potentially a semifinal field in the North America East could look like. I think we've now had 41 names up there. We haven't been able to confirm for sure that all of these athletes are competing uh, individually or on a team or what their plans are. They don't necessarily have to make that decision themselves yet. If they're registered also on a team, they can you know kind of keep it open. And then this next group, we actually do know that there are a few athletes in this group that are going to be competing on a team. I just thought this was so cool. And I'm going to let Alexis talk about why women are able to do this. But every woman you see on this list 
is 35 or older, meaning they're el eligible for a master's division. Five of the six or six of the seven are 35 or 36. And then you have J.P. Latimer, who's 40. And they all also pl placed in the top 50 of the North America East women's field in the open. Alexis, when you see this, what like I mean, obviously Caroline's getting close to she's a peer with the, many of these athletes. But how are women able to be so good, fit, and competitive as they push into their late, mid to late thirties and forties? It's nuts. I think it's like the Sam Briggs effect. But uh, when we look at these athletes, I don't know. I'm not familiar with a couple of them. But you have Amy Morton, who's a mom. Jamie Lattimore, Mer's a mom, and Mackenzie Riley um, is a mom. She has two. Um, which also is phenomenal to see, you know, their ability to have that balance and, you know, even Mackenzie Riley coming back after having uh, two babies um, and remain competitive in such a strong field when we're looking at North America East. But um, like I said, I feel like women uh, peak a bit later than uh, men as far as like their competitive uh, ceiling. And even then there's still opportunity. I think when you look at these women, they're just smart. Uh, they know how to balance their training. They know um, when to push their body and when not to push their body um, if it's going to lead to injury and that, and they just train smarter, not essentially harder. Um, I'm very impressed with Amy Morton. Uh, she's always done relatively good um, in the qualifiers, but also performing at competitions too, in master's divisions and even open divisions. Uh, same with Kenzie Riley. Jamie Latimer is a friend um, and she, you know, I know her from the Clydesdale and I watch a lot of her uh, workout videos that they post to their channel, which are also cool to see. They do one that's like across the ages. So you'll have um, a younger athlete. Mm -hmm. uh, you have Jamie Latimer who's in you know, that middle aged range. And then you have an older master athletes who I believe he's 60 plus or maybe even 65 plus. And it's cool to see them work out in line um, next to each other and have that comparison across the ages. Um, and just her overall cardiovascular endurance, again, is very impressive. She may not be the strongest, but um, she makes do when it comes to that. But it's very impressive to see, you know, these women hanging around with when we went through that list and we're like, these are pretty much guaranteed spots that are taken. And then you, you're like, oh, wait, you still have these women that are able to do it both in a master's division and uh, the open division. Yeah, and I do think Amy's competing on a team this year. Caroline Klutz probably will as well with the Grit House again, and maybe one of the or two of the others. They probably will all also do the age group semifinals, but you never know. And it's like they have every right to compete in the quarterfinals. And if they happen to do as well in the quarterfinals as they did in the open, you know, four of them would have been in a position to potentially take one of those spots if they wanted to, and the other two weren't very far away. Um, so no matter what their seasons ends up looking like of where they compete, what division, et cetera, I thought this was too cool to pass up. So I wanted to give some credit to uh, these six women that had phenomenal open and obviously tremendous amount of fitness. So we'll see how it goes for them, but very, very cool that they're able to do that. <clears throat> I'm also curious just to see which ones will do masters and uh, mm -hmm. so you highlighted the ones who are going team, but just the ones who, you know, Jamie was going to go team. Her team didn't qualify this year for quarterfinals. Um, so I'll be interested if she does the master's qualifier and the individual ones. And if she does get a bid to go to the semifinals for both, if she'll do both or focus more so on the master's division. So curious to see what they decide to do. Um, especially, you know, as a master's athlete who has found balance, maybe they choose to focus on just, you know, the master's division and uh, potentially winning that division. Yeah, man. I, I mean, I think the, the individual and age group workouts are going to be the same for all of these uh, athletes. So they, you know, they only have to do that stage of the season once. And then, you know, depending on how they do relative to both groups can make a, a decision from there. Um, so anyway, super fun and cool, uh, to be able to give some of these masters women who are still <laughs> competitive in the elite field, some credit. And then we go, we got one more group kind of that we're looking at here. Um, these are all women that also finished in the top 50 of the open this season. Again, some of them may end up competing on teams. Um, Chloe Gavin David has done team in the past. Audrey and Perry Dupois, both Canadian have done both done teams in the past. Um, I don't know much about Katrina 
DJ Como, but she had a, yeah, Shailen Lowry also typically competes on a team. She's going to Vigil a few years ago. Katrina Diaz Giacoma, you know, kind of a standout here to me in terms of both performance and that I don't know very much about her finishing third against this incredibly deep field. Um, she out of CrossFit New England. I think that's what I read. I hmm. could be wrong. Could be another one. Okay. Um, but yeah, I kind of do, do the same thing here. Just if there is anybody on the list, uh, Lex or PC that jumps out to you guys that you know something about um, that you want to share. So uh, I think I think Chloe's going to retire or she said she was retired, but who knows? Um, I feel like people say they're retired and then they're like, just kidding. Let's do one more victory lap. If that's the case, she's going to be pretty competitive there. She's very well-rounded, amazing gymnastics. So um, I'd be excited to see what she's able to do if she decides to go individual this year um, or if she still has um, one more victory lap in her. Um, and then the other person that um, we had on our list was Napoli. I think her first name is mm -hmm. Kiara. Kira. Napoli. Kira. Uh, she was 19th at semis last year. Um, she did struggle with some of the gymnastics, like the higher skill gymnastics, but um, if quarterfinals aren't, that high skilled she may be one to watch out for just because she was uh you know the upper packed at the semifinals with a couple holes um and then i'll also be interested to see what shaylin does on the individual front since she has uh gone team uh i believe the last couple of years but she's very strong uh very good um well-rounded athlete and uh, could make a push there too yeah, you pretty much hit on the names. I did look up Katrina here. Let me see if I can pull up some more information on her. But um, but it does look like she has some semifinal experience, maybe on a on a team. Granted, games. So, um, but um, yeah, I think that is out of that CrossFit New England team. So, yeah, so very impressive performance by her overall. They were but, 15th at the Granite Games that year, but yeah, I'm struggling. To, my computers are struggling over here. And yeah, it is from mm -hmm. CrossFit New England. So, you know, this is, a, again, this is a group of women who've had a great start to the season, you know, and uh, as we enter into a second stage of online qualifiers that have, you know, announced four workouts, maybe there'll be five scores, but no more than that. It takes place over a weekend. If there is uh, certainly the potential that a couple of these athletes could have great quarterfinals and push into that top 40 for a semifinal, which is obviously would be amazing for them. But it really, you know, it just over almost reemphasizes what Alexis was talking about a little while ago is that this upcoming stage of the season is going to be uh, a critical you know, portion of it, even more so than it has been in the past because there's so few spots. If you go, I don't know if you saw this stat the other day, Alexis, but if you go all the way back up to the top of this article, <clears throat> it's a it's a pretty good painting from uh, 10 years in the making. So 2014, there were 430 spots available for women in North America. Four years later, that was cut in half to 200. And six years on from there, only 80 women total in North America have a chance to make it. There's over 80 women mentioned in this article, and half of uh, those 80 will be out, allowed to compete at the semifinal this year. But... I like to kind of emphasize this thing and I'll give you a chance to talk about it as well. Basically what we're saying is there's going to be people who are really kind of heartbroken and disappointed after quarterfinals this year, you know, whether they're people who make it in, have made it many years in the past that don't make it this year because the spots are not, are at a premium or injury or whatever else is, you know, <laughs> happens, uh, penalties, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and that's like, it, it's just going to happen. And so, you know, the, the cool thing about the, this sport is, uh, although the CrossFit Games and the semifinals are major goals for a lot of athletes who are pursuing this, there's plenty of other opportunities to compete. There are competitions all the time. And, uh, you know, I'll kind of let you speak to it, but, I, you know, I would encourage them to, you know, invest in the quarterfinals as much as you can, but realize that there are other opportunities besides just the game season if you have the fitness to even be mentioned on this list. Yeah, I would say just to your point this year, again, programming matters more than anything. Um, and just looking at that and looking at the amount that will qualify for the semifinals. Um, I'm in the West right now, but like even comparing the West to the East, you know, you would almost think that the 
the east needs 60 spots to the west um it's 20 for example um just because of the depth that and the opportunity that's there uh from an athlete density piece um and what is in that top 100 from the strength of field that we've seen progress uh, over the weeks of the open so um you know, it is a point to note that you may not qualify for quarterfinals, but maybe they have like the worldwide leaderboard for quarterfinals, I'm assuming too. So you'll see how you rank and stack up overall in the world and be able to take that number and understand, you know, you have strengths in these places. Here's where your gaps are for development. And then go look at those, like you mentioned, other competitions. And Brian, you travel to uh, relatively a lot of competitions um you know small to medium level and those are great opportunities to compete and refine your craft you may not be competing against you know the top 20 in the field but you need to gain that competition experience um to be able to compete with them um and sometimes they give away good money and it's your chance to win some money so um you know that could be crash crucible norcal classic was a good example um there's i believe there's the one in utah um that they have or even rebranded the to the exactly rebranded mm -hmm. saw that um so just taking advantage of those ones and opportunities i think we also could get burned out in the qualifiers but hopefully competitions are finding better ways to utilize maybe their quarterfinal ranking to qualify for those events since um, that's kind of a, a good benchmark to have against uh the rest of the uh regions and locations yeah it absolutely is and it's it is always interesting having the conversations with the competition organizers and directors around the country and around the world of how they choose to select for their field. There are competitions that actually exist, which have the quarterfinals as like a, a qualifier, basically mm -hmm. saying you do this well in the quarterfinals and you can sign up for this competition in the elite division. Um, there are others that have their own competition, you know, uh, online qualifiers. Um, <clears throat> and I think that just in general, for if you are a competition organizer, it's worth just thinking about this concept, I've had a lot of conversations with them at their competitions in the past 12 months or so that, you know, you may, you maybe you just have to approach things a little bit differently with the pro or the elite divisions compared to the rest of the, of us, you know, if I'm wanting to compete at whatever the competition is and it, they say, oh, you have to do a qualifier to compete. Great. Okay. I, I get that. But if you're talking about wanting to have a competitive elite or pro field and you're also mandating a qualifier, you're probably limiting yourself in terms of who's going to be able to even, you know, do everything that's required to, to show up there. Um, so that might be something just to have a thought about. I know there are other competitions that have done a hybrid system. They're like, no, but you still want our qualifier to be the opportunity for someone like, you know, the everyday person to prove themselves good enough to get into the elite field. But we're also going to hold. 10 spots, five spots, half the spots, whatever it is, knowing that there'll be people that don't make it to the semis or don't make it to the games that, you know, are, are riding a high level of fitness and looking for something to do in June or July prior, you know, when they want to kind of, they were hoping to make the games or hoping to make the semis, but they didn't. And to have some spots available for athletes like that brings, you know, some attention to your competition. Um, it gives those athletes that did make it through the qualifier, maybe it, it reduces their chance to win the prize money, but it does give them a chance to compete against some potentially well-known names in the space. So that would just be a thought for competition directors out there to maybe realize that when you're talking about the pros, when you're talking about the elite athletes in this sport, there are some that are just inherently different about that division than the other divisions. And that's okay. At least to me, that's okay. So um, that's kind of the, the, the run through the North America East women's field there. Uh, Alexis, find kind of final thoughts about just this season in general or this field in general or anything that you want to say? I'm interested to see, I think, the quarterfinal workouts and then determine, you know, or at least you could project from there who could qualify um, out of them and then seeing those performances because, like you mentioned, it's going to be interesting to see um, who redoes workouts. You won't know, obviously, but um, there may be quite a bit of redoing workouts because of based on where you're at um, or just the impact of the penalties there. But I think the strongest regions we have are the East uh, in North America and then Europe. So 
um, seeing what those two fields are capable of and, you know, the talent that's going to come out of those, it will be cool to track going into the games, especially, and how many of the top performing games athletes, you know, top 10 or even top 15 at the games are from those two regions um, to analyze if they need more spots or we need to reassess our distribution um, accordingly. PC, any follow up on that? Yeah, yeah, I promise you a surprise. So, oh, yeah. oh, it's Carl. Oh. <laughs> she didn't want to come on. I had to convince her. <laughs> just, is that what you were doing, texting during the middle of the show? And uh, and what some is, other news. What is well, we'll going on yeah, Hi, Carol, I got a link sent. I said I didn't want to steal your thunder. I just had to mute it here. <laughs> no, no, I, I think she's she's doing great. She did amazing, and she's still she's doing. Amazing. You see how Carolyn spells her name, though? We won't talk about your guys' document. I actually changed it in the middle of the show <laughs> because I, I realized it was in the chart. It was misspelled. In the yeah. uh, bullet points underneath, it was spelled correctly with a Y. But as soon as I saw it, I was like, that's not right. And, I, of course, I made it. Um, so if <laughs> well, Patrick had refreshed his page, it would have uh, updated it to the correct spelling in oh, the middle of sorry. the show. Yeah, no, I don't you. That's on, it's on me. It's on me. No, it's on um, me, I guess. Especially I'm it looked bad when it was showing on the screen and then she had a comment underneath with, with her name <laughs> clearly spelled correctly. No. But, Lex, but I sure her... call us out too. We don't mind. Yeah. We can no, handle of it. Of course. They're yeah, these that's why I love these two two ladies because they 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 will call us out and I love it. They're just trying to make us better, just like how we're trying to be better as well. But I, I assured uh I assured that you wouldn't be still in Lex's Thunder because we're not gonna talk about what Lex talked about. We're gonna talk about how your season's going. Great job on the open. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, happy were you ha it. yeah, really happy, you know, fifth place, you know, I mean, um, I mean, what have you changed from this, from last season to this season to get you to, to this point in this point? I mean, any lifestyle change? I think you mentioned something that you weren't playing hockey as much anymore, or, you know, maybe <laughs> dedicating a little bit more time to training. I, I mean, I guess this is the first year since I'm three years old that I don't have more than two sports. I guess that could be different because, I mean, yeah. up until last year, I've had two or three sports every single year that I've played. Last year, I didn't play as much, um, but I still had to go to late night practices and stuff like that a couple times mm -hmm. a week and the odd games traveling this year. Uh, I decided it didn't – I had an opportunity to – to go uh, to the training camp in Toronto, but it just didn't make sense for my schedule to stop teaching um, and essentially just play hockey and CrossFit because CrossFit would have been hard to do with hockey this year as the league is a lot more professional. It actually is really professional this, this time around. Um, yeah, so that didn't make sense. So training was, I mean, last year I didn't change too, too much. I had a little bit, my shoulder was off and on. No, nothing major. Like I, I still could do everything. Um, but I know it started bugging me a little bit during the summer, mostly. Um, and part of quarterfinals, semifinals up until the summer there. But like I said, nothing major, not like nothing that changed in training. I still take two full rest days a week, which is That's different. Than I, was gonna say. Yeah. I think uh, like yeah. you're just, you train smarter. And I mean, when we say she takes her rest days, Y'all, she will not leave her couch. Like she takes the rest days. Um, those are my type of rest days. I I might have three thousand steps in those days, <laughs> especially when I'm not with Lex and the dogs, because then then I don't get as many steps in my day. But like yeah, if then I'm I force eating, her to walk like five miles with the dog, um, <laughs> even on our rest days. But I think that's like important, uh, especially for younger athletes. Is you know finding. Carolyn has good balance. Like she's a teacher. She coaches sports at the high school um, for two seasons. And then she does CrossFit kind of on the side, but still competitively. But you could have that balance and it's good for, you know, mentally and your body physically because she knows, you know, like she can't afford to get injured and then be out of school or mm -hmm. out of um coaching the kids like so she finds that balance and she listens to her body to say you know oh my shoulder's bothering me now i need to adjust or not use it for a week and she's okay with that which is probably why i've had two surgeries in the last two years i don't do that um i'm just like let's go let's go <laughs> we, are, um, we are complete but, opposites for that i've tamed yeah. you a little bit for your training but 
but I think that's yeah. good like for her and you know you could see that in her open performance she is a relatively good um open athlete when it comes to like the lighter movements um just playing burpees and uh shutting off your brain um, just burpees and so, dumbbell snatch patrick it, yeah <laughs> yeah patrick <laughs> that's why i called you out but uh you did and I, and I loved it i loved it <laughs> uh, and then you highlighted her for the next workout and we we're like no patrick that's not the one yeah uh, i was like patrick, double you know the double unders. <laughs> like you should know yeah, but i was like I did that based on your deadlift. Like that deadlift was nothing for you. Yeah, and I can deadlift. I can row, but yeah, I, mean, I just, can't do fifty double unders. I'm broken. It's so bad. <laughs> but we appreciated the highlight there. Uh, and and so. I, I felt like I felt like I needed to do that after not highlighting her in the previous one. It's a so, makeup call. Makeup call. Yeah, it's a makeup call. Exactly. It's a makeup. <laughs> I love I love that. I, I didn't know that about you, Carolyn, that you take two full rest days a, a, a per week. And I really love hearing I take, that. I take my Mondays and Thursdays off. I did that a few years ago. And I compete Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So mostly everyone trains and they take the Thursday as an active recovery, whatever that mm -hmm. means for people. And Sunday is off. But then when you go and compete, you're going to compete Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Sunday so yep. why not train Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Take mm -hmm. the Monday off. I kind of reset for my week. I, I get... Uh, my schooling done and I'm, um, you know, organizing my week. And then Thursday normally is a rest day before me before I compete. I also have less time during the week because I'm working full time as a teacher. So like my Monday and Thursdays and really Sunday afternoons, I do a lot of my prepping Press. for school corrections, um, anything that's like school related, like those are my three big days. And then the other, the other five days are or what I, what I, when are the, where I train and try to do two a set, two a days for during the week, I'll train at school, um, during my lesson prep time, instead of lesson prepping at school, I'd rather do it at, uh, at home. I just don't tell my school that I'm in the gym at that point. <laughs> Hopefully they're not hey, watching. The right now. <laughs> I was about to say, if they're watching this, thank yeah. you for tuning in. Sorry. She said that she was just joking. I still get everything done on time. Exactly. All, all is good. Um, yeah, so I try to get in my lifts and conditioning at school and then the CrossFit stuff and accessory after school, right from school. Uh, I go directly to the gym where I normally just train by myself and by myself as well at school when I'm training, um, except at lunchtime when sometimes students are there. <laughs> so I try to do stuff that I can still supervise between um, lifts, I guess. Uh, but yeah, no, I think it, I've just accumulated a lot of volume over the years because I have a lot of experience that you also don't need to be training six days a week. Um, like I enjoy the rest days. My body thrives on, on the rest days. Love it. Um, <laughs> so I just think you're, you're not losing that much fitness, you know, in one day. And yeah. if I don't get to even everything on the other days, I don't think it's the end of the world. So Lex and I program like I, for, like for, for our gym at CrossFit Coliseum and for the elite program, which is what we follow ourselves. So we, we program ourselves everything. We just know that like what we need to work on, we hit basically every movement once a week. So if you miss it one week, it's like, it's okay. I'll get it next week in some sort of fashion. So it's not the end of the world if I miss a training piece, especially if I'm tired after a long day of school and I'm just not gonna hit the piece with a good intensity. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna push it off to another day. And if I wanna do it, I wanna do it. And if I don't, it's okay. I'm going to hit it the following week. If it was a ring muscle up that I didn't get. Normally I try not to skip on a weakness type workout. If I, if I do skip it, I'll make sure that I like, I actually will get it done. Sometimes the other ones I'm like, nah, that's okay. That's not like, it wasn't a bad workout for me anyways. I'll scrap it. I'm very similar where if I don't get it one week, I wait till the next month and you know, I'll, <laughs> you know, <laughs> my, my gym, year, my gym, my gym, yeah, my gym jokes around because I, I went back. I, I was gone for a week. I was gone for two weeks for the military, and then I was, I was there last week Monday, but then I showed up this Monday, and I said, like, "Oh, it's Patrick's weekly drop in," you know. <laughs> so wow. and then you're I, on the road doing other stuff. I guess some, <laughs> some of these concepts that you're talking about, Carolyn, you know, they're not they're not the necessarily foreign concepts, but they always are intriguing to me. You know, it reminds me to. Uh, of some stuff that Vellner has said over the years because he used to you know, be working full time and training. And he's like, well, it just forces me to be efficient in the gym that I'm I'm not wasting time when I'm wasting. there. And, and ultimately in this sport, <clears throat> intensity and efficiency are the name of the game. You know, you can train all day if you want to, but you might go to a semifinal 
and be asked to do a max lift and a 10 minute Metcon. And that's your entire day. And you're on the floor for 15 minutes total for three lifts that take 15 seconds at most. And then a 10 minute Metcon. And that's it. And is an, is an eight hour training day or, you know, even if you're doing six hours, four hours, is it necessary? And I, I don't have the answer to that question. It might be different for different people. And I think all- Vilmer would be pretty similar here. Like I'm sure he doesn't warm up for, you know, a ridiculous amount of time when he was working. And it's the same thing with me. Like I just don't have an hour to do. Well, I mean, I like, yeah, just, I won't do it, but I basically <laughs> go right in cold. Like yesterday I went r- cold, literally I was like 400 meter row. It was, a 15 minute AMRAP, 400 meter row, eight bar muscle ups, eight sandbag cleans, four row climbs. Yeah. And it was like that 400 meter row is going to be my warm up. Yeah. Like the class was about to start. I needed the rope. Get it done. Like just get it done when you can and then move on to the next thing. And then, like, it, like I don't, I'm not at the gym for like the only time I spend a lot of time at the gym is the weekend and it's my social hour. Like, I, mm-hmm. I need to talk to people, chat, you know, it's your comfortable, safe space. Like you just feel happy there. It's like, I'll, I'll waste some time there, which sometimes Lex gets on my case if I spend too much time. If yeah, we're, right. if I would say, the I would say I'm the efficient one when it comes to working out. I'm like, okay, I programmed a conditioning piece. Here's the strengths and here's the Metcons. All right, our conditioning is our essentially our warm Uh You're going to sweat. You're going to be getting your whole body worked go into that and then you're warm for your lifts so just start your lifts like you don't need the breaks um so i'm like the one that's like back to back just because my work schedule also you know um meetings start relatively early for me uh but yeah i think you know it kind of has helped carolyn as far as like time management and balance when you're looking at you know semifinals or even the games is she's able to warm up efficiently go into a workout and you don't need to spend, you know, two hours getting ready for something. And we have a good balance too. Like, like for many years, I programmed for myself the entire thing. And now Lex will do um, the conditioning pieces and she writes my whole strength program that I'm doing and that she's doing as well, of course. Um, And that some of the people at my gym are also doing. And then I focus on programming all of the Metcons, um, or accessory, we might share some of that. So that's taken some load off of my plate as well, where I had to come up with everything before. Um, I just, I've never, I've never once in my career followed another program. I've only followed, uh, when I first started CrossFit Coliseum, which was my home affiliate. And then I very shortly after that kind of took over the programming there and have done that from all the years. I love programming, I like, I, I like doing it. <laughs> And I, um, my, I'm, I'm, my computers are not really working over here, but it's oh, like, shoot. was this your 11th or 12th or 11th year doing the open? 11th year doing the open. So 2014 was my first year. I began CrossFit in 2013, April, 2013. And then there was no, um, there was no scale division at that point in the open. So everything was super light engine burpees, light barbells and stuff like that. So I'd qualified, I think I'd, fit, I'd finished like ninth or something in, the Canada East region at that point. I was in the final heat at, at regionals for day one. And it was the first work, I was a hang snatch. And I just remember looking over and I have Camille leblanc Bazinet, Michelle um, Letang, and a bunch of just perennial like semifinal games and games athletes. And they're like opening up a hang snatch at like 175 or 180. And I opened at 105. <laughs> like I had no business being there, but I was great at open because I had some low skill. I learned how to do ring muscle ups pretty fast. And I was doing them in singles in the open at that point. I was at 14.4. Mm-hmm. Made it there, but I like it wasn't that great. Um, it was like good event, bad event. Good because like I had some strengths just from all of my training background, but I had some big holes. Um, and it was kind no, of like that. I did the open in 2014 years. for the first time, and I did not make it to the top heat of my regional. Just to let you know that. <laughs> but then in 2015, Thanks. I did work. 2015 is my worst year in the open because then they added scale, but then they added the handstand push ups there. So I had mm. a very bad workout with handstand push ups. And then, so that's that's my worst. Um, and 2024 was not your best year in the open, even though you took fifth. Yep. yep. Third place 20, back in 2018, 20. which is the biggest ever open. The best oh, yeah, year was, for participation was, was 2018. Yep. Yep. Did they have payouts for the open back then? They did not. So this is your biggest open payday this year. 
that's why we that's why we may have done the workouts more than once yeah I, I was <laughs> hey, I mean, like, it's, it's... like once it, once i was like in the top 15 after week one i was like no okay i'm gonna go for it like you're you're right there then week two came out and i was like i'm good at two of the three movements so i once these double unders are gone i was like what's left in the open for week three unless they don't do a max lift like you're gonna have thrusters chest of bars bar muscle ups i'd like toast of ours. I'm like, oh, I, I can do well in week three. So redo that week two as much as you can um, and try to have a good double under day, which I got better every time, which is good. I mean, the, you know, the, it's a decent payout for, you know, for three workouts for the open, even if you finish fifth. Um, it's more than my monthly salary almost. <laughs> yeah. And it's more than, a, and, and it's probably more than 90% of the athletes at the games. Yeah. yeah. I don't, maybe not 90 percent anymore okay, but know, a, yeah. a big chunk and it's more than the semi-final payout was up until last year uh to, mm -hmm. for winning it yeah. and that's like to win a semi-final is crazy hard so i think that makes total sense you know and i i you know you hear people say i uh, just kind of cruise through the open whatever but if you do find yourself in that situation after one or two weeks by all means like yeah you know, yeah the, not... the, la the last couple of years i didn't redo any and then like i said this year because i i felt i was close enough on week one that i went for it um, it just made sense, but I've always wanted to do well in the open. Like some people don't care about the open. I think I have a good streak the last few years. So I like to have good confidence going into my season. If I do the open and I'm way behind, I don't feel as good. And I feel like I'm falling behind, especially because I do train relatively like on my own. A lot of times, like I want to know if how I, how I am against people right now. Like I don't get to have a training camp full of semi-final and games athletes i have a few people at the gym that i can uh train with Pace off of, but yeah. they're not uh, they're still not at the semi-final or games level athletes so i want to i you know I, I try to push the open i i have pride in doing well when i put my name on a leaderboard Any would, leaderboard. would you ever straight. consider if you if you know if you qualified for the games again would you consider you know taking a week or two and pursuing going to a training camp in the games prep and being around some other athletes or are you pretty comfortable with where you're at I teach all the way until uh, the last weekend of uh, June. So I wouldn't be able to go anywhere up until July. Um, and then at that point, um, I'm going to California the last few years to train with uh, with Lex. And then I, I get pushed there because Lex has a lot of different weaknesses and strengths than me. Like she's much stronger than me. I'm not the strongest I get by. I, I'm strong on some lifts, uh, mostly lower body. <laughs> um, but she'll push me in certain things and i also have a lot of fun when i'm there in california i have my doodles i have her there so it's it's a balance too of being in a happy environment uh training so i want that as well by the way every time i see this profile this picture i'm it makes me happy because <laughs> because i took it so it's like it's wow. great i really yeah. I was yep. tired after that one. Everyone's drinking out of that, and I'm there cleaning yeah. my feet. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I grabbed that. I looked over, and I saw I'm like, what the hell is going I, on? I'm like, I that's probably the beginning of my rhabdo right there. Oh, oh, you weren't the only one that year, but uh, yeah. Oh, That Mary workout killed me. I had, I had rhabdo for weeks after. Oh, wow. I couldn't do I couldn't do a pull-up. My arms were so swollen. I was stuck like this. You, the only workout you did after that was the sprint, right? Yes, and I could not move my, my arms. Calves. She couldn't move her arms. And I landed weird. So you know, Mary, you had two parts. You did the first part, then you moved to the second moved part. So part. I had set up my mat in the first part, but not in the second part. So when I got to that second rig, when I came down, I twisted my ankle and had a weird uh, calf strain. Mm. So almost honestly, it's it's better that I got eliminated, even though. I yeah, the next work I, I had pegboards. <laughs> I took second in the sprint and I had no arms. I couldn't warm up. And my calf was strained. Like I, I would love, 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 love to do another sprint workout like that. Like a pure sprint, not the 500 meter or 500 yard sprint, mm. a pure sprint and a zigzag, like an athletic one. Yeah. Did Hel Turi, did Turi Helgedotter take the win on that? She, uh, no, it, it was Kristen Holta. Kristen Holta. Holta. The one, yeah. yeah someone. Uh, Europe. Helga Donner had a good um, first or second because we we went multiple times. Yeah, he, he was one of the faster ones as well. It was like her, Tia, me, Holta, maybe Brandon. I think was also very fast uh, on yeah, that she one. Was 
Yeah. But that one was very funny to look at some of the people, how they cut on the zigzag. I'm like, well, you've only done straight linear work your whole life. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> I remember a, I mean, looking at the most... walk because we got to do a run through. Yep. I was like, oh, you guys are not. You, want, you, know, you, you have a massive advantage compared to most CrossFitters, obviously playing hockey where there's, you know, there has to be lateral movements all the time. But in most training programs, that's a huge area that's just missing from CrossFit. Everything is forward and backwards straight or up line. and down. Yep. And, and, that, and that's why, because I've not played hockey this year, I've purposefully continued. I don't know if you've watched some of my videos that I've posted and stuff, but like, you'll see me do a lot of lateral work, single leg stuff. Because I've done that my whole life, if I stop doing that, especially without practicing for hockey or playing hockey or soccer, like you're losing a part of your fitness that you've done your whole life. So it's important to add that. And like you said, like CrossFit's very – like sagittal plane linear, like there's two things that's missing, like lateral work and no rotational stuff. So I really feel like that's where people could be adding, you know, some med ball tosses to the side, even if it's warm ups, um, some lateral movement of some sort, because there's a lot of imbalances in terms of um, that part of people's trainings. Even just injury prevention. I mean, uh, when I was coaching soccer teams, obviously there's lateral movement, but I made them do ladder drills as warm ups all the time. And I would do that in, in, CrossFit gyms, if I was doing personal training with small enough uh, groups of people, just to throw in some of that lateral stuff, um, it just keeps the joints healthy. So especially if you have the time and space to do it, it doesn't, it's not so stressful on the body. It's an easy thing to do. Yeah, I do a lot of it. That's my school gym. That's my school affiliate. Is that where CrossFit. you are right now? No, I'm at home. This is my, this is my living room. That should be my, that should yeah, be my dining third. room table. Yeah, we're, we're on the eighth floor of a condo and we have a full gym set up. I put the, the, the curtains down right now. So the light didn't go too much in. A lot it's of it's, it's like Thursday. the machines and barbells. She's one from Rogue. There you go. It's Thursday. You yeah. should be resting. So I wasn't going to, but uh, the gym equipment is always no uh, ever present, I guess. There. No, I didn't do anything. Oh, I coached my girl's soccer team at lunch. That's all I did. You, you bring up, uh, I believe it was you, Lex, you brought up Rogue. Um, Carolyn, you have a very unique rela relationship with Rogue, not just as a competitor, but a record breaker. But this past year, you were kind of in a different role. Um, you know, you were basically the demo team. Um, and uh, can you can you talk about how, how that came about, how you ended up in, uh, in, uh, in Texas this year? <laughs> yeah, I mean, when uh, Katie messaged me on um, Instagram, a little bit before the rogue invitational and they were looking to test some workouts out and i was not going to turn down any offer by uh sure. katie and bill so i actually went to columbus um maybe three or four weeks prior to the rogue invitational and i got to test all of the workouts except for the max deadlift because that's not going to give them any information <laughs> um but tested essentially all of them to the best that I could with the, like it was in the warehouse that they have there, which mm -hmm. is humongous. Yep. Um, a whole rope in the middle of the warehouse. They had a rope that they installed in the middle of an aisle with all, with the logs well, the that I had to run. Yeah. And I was like, this is so cool. I want to take a picture, but I'm not allowed to because, um, you know, I couldn't say that I was testing anything, of course. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, but this is awesome. And then Katie ended up sending it to me after the Rogue Invitational so that, um, I could post it after. Um, but yeah, so I tested the workouts there, gave some good feedback on what I thought the workouts were. Really liked them. I mean, there was a lot of hinging, so I probably liked it. Um, yeah. And legs. But awesome um, experience there. And then Katie messaged me if I wanted to go to Texas during the Rogue Invitational in case they had last minute tweaks um of testing different crazy things. weather or anything like that and then i was like oh this is awesome she's like oh yeah you can go maybe on the broadcast um because they are doing those rotations of people i never ended up doing that but um i got to do another workout there um on the field at 5 30 maybe 6 a.m mm -hmm. it was pitch black and i'm running up the hill and i'm going down the hill and it's a little bit slippery and i'm like I'm like quick feet, quick feet, quick feet. I'm like, don't fall. It's like, you can't see anything. It's dark, dark, dark. Um, doing the high box jumps <laughs> in the dark. In the rain. Was, or was yeah. it raining there? Um, it hadn't, it, it was dry at that point. But they had put um, a, um, that white piece of material over the box is really nice. It, it wasn't slippery at all. It felt safe. 
um it just was like that was after like the st sun starting to come up there um yeah it was uh, pretty neat so i got to I think, have some workouts early i think like your experiences there also came from carolyn's been doing rogue invitational Challenges. and then you know different rogue events for years now since mm -hmm. like covid when they had it virtually arnold online, and yeah. um and brought a judge to everybody who qualified and had them do it which was amazing and probably the best ran that is uh, the, online competition that is the comp i've ever done the the ro the 2020 road when they sent a yep. judge yep they sent us the equipment it was everything they sent a judge to, to test it was amazing that's when i first started doing everything rogue. So i did the first uh individual qualifier qual for, for rogue invitational there and then that's probably the best execution of a competition maybe maybe semi-finals virtual before uh in 2021 but that one I tried getting because I had I had gotten my spot to the games in 2020 and I lost it yeah. um, through the open. So I was supposed to go four years in a row and I'd lost it because they took away the national champion. So then it drew back to the top 20. So I'd qualified in the open. Didn't get to compete. Well, I just chose not to compete in the first half of the season because I already had my spot. Everything shuts down March 13th. You know, the whole world is, mm -hmm. is gone. Rogue is the only competition that took place after covid it was like in june too mm -hmm. i messaged dave because I, I finished sixth place there and if you look at the field it was stacked yep um it's probably the best in shape i've ever felt too it's 2020 um younger a little bit <laughs> but i messaged dave and i was like would you consider this as a qualifier because it was supposed to be a qualifier uh, mm -hmm. but because i think they dropped the name of crossfit and it had changed to in uh online Dave was just replied, nope. <laughs> I was like, shit. <laughs> Let's give you um, some credit there. Here's These are the five women that beat you that year. Tia, Sarah Sigmund's daughter, Kara Saunders, Jamie Simmons, Laura Horvath. So, yeah, that's pretty impressive. And I was like, this is more legit than mm -hmm. qualifying through the open. I was like, yeah. they sent judges. You had six workouts, six or seven workouts. Um, it's, I'm not judged by any person. Like I wasn't judged by my coach. I wasn't judged, mm -hmm. you know, by a significant other or anything. Like it was like one time to do it. Yeah. You had a, a time to do music. it. So in like my mind, like, quiet without music and oh by my yourself. God. it was, yeah, dead silence. That was such, such a unique experience, but that started my relationship uh, with rogue. So like in my head, I, I have four cross the games because I feel like I should have qualified for that 2020, but mm -hmm. I, yeah, uh, I have three. What do you think about the move of Rogue to Scotland? So cool. Yeah. So cool. Love it. I'll go vacation. Love <laughs> it. I think uh, I think Rogue's been um, a leader in CrossFit for so long. I think in 2020 when they pulled that uh, that competition and in the online format that they had, the multiple screens that they had, uh, the sending of the judges, just the standardization of online competitions in terms of professionalism and looking over video reviews and stuff like that. Um, I get that they're very strict and it's a long list. I do challenges all the time, but I would rather it be like that than um, some of the things that happen online, like most of the time. Um, and then like moving to Europe and then testing that the water's there. I think it's awesome. I think the European crowd um, is going to thrive. They're going to be excited. It's going to be an amazing atmosphere, um, and I'm happy that you know Rogue is is moving there and um, and going to be doing that there. Hopefully, yes. I can get there. No, it's a really it's a really really well said that that they're you know leading in a lot of those fronts. And there's you know there was there were some pretty harsh penalties last year in the in the Rogue qualifier. You know, uh, didn't stand up the final step of a lunge, and your workout just stops there. You don't get credit for anything that you've done beyond that. But I feel that at the at the highest level, most of the athletes would say they would rather have that because it's going to encourage this virtuous movement that we should be practicing in CrossFit anyway, as opposed to some of the other examples where, you know, people are getting away with uh, things that are much, much uh, more obvious than that because of the systems that can't can't manage it. Um, and and even at the Rogue this year, they had that multiple screen that you could do in, in different lanes. like. They're just, they've just been leaders and innovators in, in the CrossFit space in terms of equipment and just ideas. So um, 
I'm obviously not a sponsored athlete by Rogue, but I do anything that they challenge people <laughs> to do and stuff. And they, they <laughs> try to get on their good side as much as I can. <laughs> smart. They've just been like the leader of, you know, I guess the highest standard that you could possibly have. I mean, they'll during challenges in the year, they make you take out a tape measure and measure the diameter of your plates or mm -hmm. your sandbag and other things. And just calibrating and weighing everything it has to be a digital scale if they used like the i don't know what is it the analog scale you're yeah. already out they won't even take that into consideration you have to show the di diameter of your pull-up bar like everything they're looking for um just to make sure that it is standardized across and there is no room for like a gray area to say somebody cheated um, I think somebody tried to in the past and we're using lighter weights on some of the challenges. And so they had to go back and say, how can we prevent this from happening? And, you know, that was their way to say, you know, we're just going to hold everybody to this high standard. And if you don't adhere to it, you're out before we even look at your full video. When I did if, that, if there's a rule, there's probably a story, right? Like yeah. if there's a rule, there's a story behind it. So I know that there was some, you know, attempted cheaters and stuff in the past. So if it's going to settle that. I'm all yeah. For it. And they didn't have the rule there. So they ended up probably having to pay them and uh, call them the winner then. So. When I, I did know, the thousand pound, that. when I did the thousand pound challenge, it, it was like an hour just for making sure. I mean, be, just like finding the bar that weighed 45 pounds, you oh, know, yeah. You know, our most of our gym bars, they're they're older bars, they've been dropped and stuff like that. They're coming at like forty four pounds. Like, no, it's gotta be forty five. You know, not, you know, um, so I actually had to use one of our coaches' bars, you know, to get it right. But it's just like if the 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 level of detail they put in that. And you know, like I said, I know Drake, I know the judging crew pretty well because I, I judged that rogue the first year and it was an honor. And anyone that's like you said, Carolyn, it's like anyone that's involved with Rogue or gets the opportunity to work with Rogue. You know, you take it. Brian, Brian got to experience that this past year. I've experienced it as a judge, and you've experienced it as an at, both as an athlete and as a member of, I guess, their 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 their, their staff, their yeah, team. So, you know, and I just I think what you said was, you know, yeah, they are the leaders, they are the innovators, and you know, CrossFit's a lot better. The sport of fitness. We're just not talking cross. We're talking about like you know, strongman and some of the other things they're doing. I mean, yeah, I think they're the way to go. So. Yeah, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that, on the move. I like it. Yeah. But, yeah, I, we, we don't want to keep you ladies any any further. Uh, Lex, I will say, um, you know, CJ seems to be a fan of both of you. But tune in late, but whoever likes it, she's crushing it. Always the best show in the space. So, I, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Well, we didn't, didn't we didn't just invite a, some random person on. Uh, nope. If you missed the start of the show. She's super plugged into CrossFit space. Uh, she's constantly giving feedback. She does some support for the Clydesdale podcast. And yep. these these girls, they know what's going on. So um, they're here <laughs> yeah. for a reason. I didn't and write throw. I didn't. I, didn't I know. Want my autocorrect there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You throw yeah, that okay. stuff in there. Yeah, Lex over here correcting a correcting me. I'm not <laughs> a whole time. I know how to spell. <laughs> That's one thing I learned in my French school. It's like all the differences <laughs> between the, the there's, yeah. the through. Like, no, I got it. That's just yeah. my autocorrect. Oh. Except in, in that area, you guys say like calor and oh, yeah. Yeah, spell. I had Favor. to adjust when I went to school in the States. So I, I know I know how you guys spell. Um, <laughs> well, uh, would definitely like to have you guys, both you ladies on um, again some point, And especially Lex, we'd love to have you on and pick your brain and expertise. And, um, you know, I, I guess next time we'll see you we'll probably be in Knoxville, huh? I don't okay. count. I don't. I don't look past the. I haven't booked anything. Gotcha. I, I, don't, I don't look past the quarters. I, it's going to be. Sure. It's going to be hard. It's like one bad workout and you're done. Yeah. And there's I'm max, glad. There's a max double under. Like I, I'm no offense. I'm not qualifying if there's a max like. A <laughs> hundred unbroken double unders each round. They have to be unbroken. Like I'm not going to lie. I'm not. I'm not qualifying. <laughs> if they're single, she's the okay. We'll just. Huh? I said if it's single unders, we're okay. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> well, I'm glad Lex got the shirt from the games. So she gave it to yeah, me. That's awesome. I, she doesn't I, wear have, it I have one too. Top. I just didn't have time to put it on. I know. I was like, I remember I had, I, I went to go to the, I asked Brian, I'm like, Brian, I need to get two shirts, you know, because I remember you asked me down at the warm up area. He's like, hey, 
can I get two? And I'm like, yeah, of course. So, yeah. <laughs> but I'm glad. Those are special edition. If you see the 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 uh, capital is built into the uh, into the eye. <clears throat> So. Yeah, and we didn't know at the time that that would be the last uh, the last games in Madison. So, collector's item, <laughs> legend. I'm not even yeah. sure if I have one of those. You probably don't. <laughs> I always end up giving up giving away the shirts, and then I realize like, oh, we may never make those again. <laughs> but yeah, thank you guys both for jumping on, Carolyn. Great to see you. Good luck in the quarterfinals, Alexis. I'm thank glad you, that uh, people got to see a little bit of your knowledge and expertise. Did a great job of articulating. <laughs> Um, you know, just how competitive this season's going to be. So appreciate you guys. Thank you both. See you Bye, guys. Carl. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Text too soon. <laughs> Bye. Cool. Well, that was fun to do. I mean, we had a good time with Nico last week. Alexis, obviously doing a great job this week. We're going to do one more of these next week prior to the quarterfinals, which will be the week after that. Um, so, can be looking forward to that. We'll have an article, of course, previewing it. We're going to shift our attention out to the West, North America West. And then we're not trying to or intentionally ignoring other regions around the world that uh, while the North America West, East, and European regions have been shrunk in terms of the number of qualifying spots, the other regions of the world have expanded their number of spots. So they all have mm -hmm. 40 rather than 30, <clears throat> which means that most of the athletes that are going to be uh, competitive there or that you are familiar with there will actually have an easier time making it to, through the quarterfinals to the semifinals relatively than uh, years in the past. But as we get closer to the semifinals, then we will really hone in on the relative depths of fields in those competitive regions as well. So just hitting on the big three right now, because clearly there's other people as well that have realized and are talking about how critical this quarterfinal stage of the season is going to be for those three. Um, we're only choosing either the men or the women from each one of those divisions, but obviously the other are just as competitive as we said at the start of the show. Um, and it should be fun to follow along during the quarterfinals and see who is able to make it through. We're expecting certainly some of the big names to make it with ease. Others to maybe have a hard time depending on some of the variables we talked about. And as always, we can expect some up and comers to have some standout performances, which is why we watch sports. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, before we go, um, just kind of happened while we're on air. Um, something that I've known for a while, uh, kind of expecting, but um, uh, with a heavy heart, we announced that it's due to an injury that hasn't fully healed yet. Devin has made the decision to step back from team competition. Her focus has shifted to getting 100% healthy as she has a long future ahead of her in the sport. She's decided that moving into the alternate role is what's best for both of her and the team at this time. Devin is a true competitor, has worked hard, and we are confident she will be back. Jesse Smith has stepped in for Team Invictus, and Hannah Black has stepped in for Team Invictus and Unconquerable. The Invictus community is grateful that we were able to find this awesome replacement for Unconquerable, the Unconquerable team and a solution that keeps all our teams competing at full speed. The goal remains to keep the Philly Cup trophy in San Diego. Yeah, one of the... Do they still have a, the uh, uh, a qualified for the games every single year? Yeah, yep. yeah. They've been, ever since they has been, has been uh, you know competing as a team in this sport at the highest level for as long as anybody. Uh, obviously, they did get the championship last year. Devin Kim being a part of that um, young athlete, super talented. We saw her compete in, individually in the off season out in Dubai. Um, clearly making the decision that's going to be the best decision for her in the long run. I think she has a, lo loves this sport, loves competing, and has intention of doing it for a long time, maybe team and eventually uh, giving a run at individual. So obviously wish her the best with the recovery process and, and just kind of managing that. But uh, we've seen it before where you know people can make the decision that's best for them in a season and still end up coming back better for it. So that's what we'll be hoping for for Devin. And clearly – with the uh, caliber of athletes they have over there. Um, you never like to see, you know, someone who's, uh, you know, proven to be a champion uh, missing from your team, but they have some very, very capable and talented athletes that can step in and fill in those roles. And they should still be both competitive teams out there in the, in the West. Yeah. I mean, just right now, I'm just really heartbroken for Devin. Obviously I have a, a, a personal release relationship with her and someone that I've known for a while. And um, she's um she's just an amazing, amazing woman. I've seen her grow into a, from a girl to a woman. And, you know, she wasn't a hundred percent last year, uh, at the games. Um, but yeah, she was a key reason why they, 
they won that title and um she was excited for this year she really was with the prospect of running it back and also you know learning from lauren one of her idols lauren fisher and also learning from chandler and then you know of course doing it with uh competing and with joshua again so um you know yeah it's i mean it's 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 cool because jesse who jesse gets a chance to compete alongside her husband and chandler but uh you know again i'm just kind of heartbroken for devin because i know how much work she puts in it and how much how how big of a future she has in this sport i mean she just just turned 22 um a week ago and um you know we got to see her firsthand how she does against an individual field and you know finished eighth um you know she should have did she would have done better you know if it wasn't for one event the lifting event and you know but you know she's just but she's just you know big game big game dev like when it's game day that she shows up she shows up and you know she competes and yeah so my heart goes out to her her and her, especially her family um her mom and her dad who i've gotten to know a lot well the last couple of years and uh her boyfriend blake they, she has a great support group not just her family but also the uh, the Invictus community, and you know, and again, she just drops down that alternate role. Role, so who knows? You know, there might be an instance maybe she does make that appearance. So either way, um, always good to have alternates. It's all, especially if you can have an alternate of that cal those calibers. So you know, some reshuffling. Um, I mean, obviously Hannah Black being on the Inconquerable team with uh, Emily Lugman, and I forgot. Uh, I think who are the boys? Uh, I'm trying to remember who the guys are. But I'll either check way, after that, this week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that that team is going to be very good. Just uh, you Hannah, know, Hannah Black in general. I think the move out there has been really positive for her. Yes. That seems to be an environment that she's thriving in and loving. Uh, you know, obviously the stuff on social media is is what people want it to be. But it seems like from people we know out there that that's a good fit for her and a great opportunity for her here. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, that's about it. So, um. Yeah, thanks for everyone tuning in. It was a uh, great show. Obviously, Lex, I'm glad everyone got to meet the Lex that we know. Very knowledgeable, very cool, um, and um, you know, and also an opportunity for you all to kind of see a different side of Carolyn as well. I mean, you know, a lot of people think she's kind of yeah, but she, that once you get to know her, you're you know, she's awesome. So we've had the opportunity to get to know her pretty well and had conversations with her. So it's cool to have them both on. But um, yeah, Brian, what are your plans this weekend? Anything? Probably one of the more chill weekends that I've had in a in a long time. So I'll work out a little bit, play some disc golf, yep. and um, yeah, just maybe you know some prep work for some stuff coming up, but not nothing too stressful. No travel. Cool. Well, that's good. Um, I did find out today. I have a ticket to WrestleMania. I probably, i more likely, I will not. <laughs> more likely, I will not attend because, uh, yeah. I mean, I just found out today, so it's just kind of like looking at flights out there. I'm just like, uh, yeah. And I just have a. I have a busy couple of weeks after this week and just, yeah, Damn, dude. That's, I know that's it's, tough. It's a bummer. It really is. And I'm just like, Oh, but yeah. Anyways. Yeah. I'm kind of bummed out about that, but who knows? Maybe something, I don't know. Knowing me, I might make a last Check on spirit. <laughs> <laughs> what? It takes me 18 hours to get to Philadelphia. <laughs> Cost $18. Though. Yeah, I guess. True, true, true. But, um, well, Hey, thanks for everyone for tuning in. Hopefully you enjoyed the show. Uh, we had some great, sh uh, some great shows this week. Uh, so remember, if you missed any of the shows, you can rewatch it back on YouTube, or you can go on any of your podcast formats, download it, and listen while while you work out or drive or whatever. So again, we appreciate all the support. Always support from HGR, CBD, the, the crew out uh, Carl that has. Uh, you know, they've just been great. So we'll definitely appreciate their support. Again, use friend 20 for 20% off your HCR CBD product purchase. So a lot of cool stuff. Dude, on there. I've been, I've been since now that I'm back for yeah. a more consistent period of time. And I've been like, <laughs> man, I've been like sore and you know, whatever, but at least I have the full, uh, array yep. of, of products available from, from HDR to help out with some of that stuff. Well, I told you we did that six rep front max uh front squat max yesterday well my quads are feeling it today so this morning woke up was rubbing this on my quads and i'm just like all right come on and uh yeah it, it i mean just that 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 cool relief you feel on it is just so soothing but then it's like you know once it goes away you're just like oh i gotta put more of that on there and but um yeah so 
we'll appreciate all of you, everyone tuning in as always. And yeah, have a great weekend. A lot of stuff going on this weekend in terms of the sports world, you know, final four women's final four. Um, you know, I want, yeah, that we didn't get a chance to talk about, it, but the Iowa LSU game was fun to watch 12 points, what 12.3 million viewers. So that's great to see that, yeah. you know, women collegiate sports are just crushing it. So, but, um, yeah, everyone be safe. Have a great weekend and we'll see you next week. And as always be friendly, our friends. <laughs>